Hi, welcome to episode 76 of the American Tributaries podcast, where to break out of the bubbles we all live in, we're using modern technology to explore the various currents of people in our great country, kind of like a 21st century Lewis and Clark journey. I'm your host, Michael Whitten, here in Brooklyn, New York, and thank you for joining me in this exploration of America. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Reverend Mark Gensler, who is the rector at Christ Church Cobble Hill, just around the corner from me. Um, before we get started, I should thank uh, Anne and Barrett for hosting the holiday party that gave us the opportunity to meet. So, uh, Mark, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you doing? And could you share a bit of your story? Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And it was nice to meet you at Anne and Barrett's party with those very neighborly itself. There were a lot of neighborly conversations going on it, in that. And uh, I'm remembering that I'm not sure what happened to you afterward in, in, in the party, but I know I was sort of taking refuge in the quiet room in the front, you know, which is, uh, we could explore that metaphor if we want to as, as well. <laughs> you know, when you are in lovely holiday party, what, um, cacophonous situations like that, you know, do you seek out, do, do you dive in, do you seek out the quiet space in, in the corner? I'm sure it's a personality index of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I've, yeah. I've just shared something about myself in that sense. I, I love Anne and Barrett and uh, the various parties that they hold. And I do tend to seek out sort of the quieter spaces and the one-on-one uh, conversations with random people who turn out to be my neighbors. <laughs> um, how long have you been in the neighborhood? Uh, four and a half years. Okay. Now. But uh, we knew Anne and Barrett prior. Uh, my husband, Christo, has known Barrett for years through friends of his, uh, I think from um, his New Haven uh, growing upness. So that's how I know Anne and Barrett. And we just happened to move to that neighborhood for my work. And mm-hmm. then, you know, thus. So, yeah, uh, about a half year before the pandemic. <laughs> okay. Is when we moved there. Well, you know, um, I was thinking, like, just offhand, and our very initial interaction was, I think, very interesting for me as I reflected upon it because there were two aspects that I kind of thought were kind of highlighted some of the my personal tendencies but i think a tendency that are easy for people to fall into i think one one of the things that i think i've been trying to be more mindful of is i I guess and i feel like as i've gotten i don't know if it's as i've gotten older or as i've just seen things differently i feel like i'm talking more like almost like in this kind of buddhist way of like like same saying the same thing and it's both ways at the same time so like in the one sense i think that uh, the sense of like diversity is better than what it ever was before. And obviously we're, we're particularly talking about like kind of racial diversity um, in, in one respect, but in the other respect, I find that in, you know, in our neighborhood, there could, there could be diverse racial diversity when people get together, but then there's oftentimes a lack of professional diversity. Like you will go out and you'll see other people who graduate from the same kind of schools and do the same kind of jobs. And, you know, the, the financial part of living in any neighborhood kind of will winnow people out to the people who can afford, that's where they, they can live. But I've never gone to a party, for instance, and never, there's rarely is there a police officer or a firefighter, not even like public school teachers. I mean, there are some, but not as much. Um, and I've certainly never, um, you know, had encountered somebody uh, who was a, a, a you know a pastor. Um, it was spiritual. Um, so in that one respect, it was kind of like interesting to to have like, oh wow, this is this is a rare <laughs> interaction. But the other part of it was, and I think you kind of alluded as when, when we first started talking, which was like there were a there was a whole set of like kind of like expectations that I had that I didn't like kind of jump to, but I was kind of prepared for when I heard, oh, this is the priest at the you know church around the corner um and i'm forgive me if that's not the right term to use to refer to you but like there and and it wasn't like hard and fast on what those were but there was a certain (laughs) sense of like kind of general like stereotypes or expectations i had um and obviously i I hope i've conditioned myself to be able to kind of go into conversations with people without kind of acting on any of those things but i was just kind of wondering your thoughts on those two observations oh definitely and as you and i talked and I mean, we go in many different directions uh, 
with this one. And I'd be curious to ask you a few questions because it's as interesting for me to know how people perceive, um, in this case, you know, a, 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 a figure of public religion, so to speak, you know, yeah. as opposed to someone who is, uh, you know, many people have some religious, most have some, you know, some spiritual element to their lives, but um, it doesn't make itself apparent with, you know, in an identity badge or, right. or, a, or a conversational sort of way like that. And there's, you know, there, there's no way that I, in that sense, can hide. Although, <laughs> as an aside, as I've said to Christo, uh, my husband, that there are any number of times that, uh, years ago when I proverbially be sitting in a bar and you fall into conversation with someone, you know, not unlike a self-sorting sort of situation like a neighborhood holiday party. Although there were, there were people at Anne and Barrett's party who weren't from our neighborhood, of course. But, um, but, um, but I, when I'm in that sort of setting, you know, metaphorically and or concretely in, in the, in the bar, having, having a drink, having uh, just, I, there would always be that question in my mind when the conversation always gets to, so what, what do you do? in that sense. And I would always have to make a decision because if I say, Oh, I'm a priest, you know, or I'm an Episcopal priest, I I will often nuance it because especially in New York with such a huge uh, Roman Catholic or post Catholic sensibility, people hear priests, they assume Roman Catholic and then, which is cool. And I get that a good deal of the time. Um, especially if I go out wearing a clerical collar, um, you know, people would say, Oh, hello, you know, hi father. Although my female colleagues, cause the Episcopal church will ordain women, of course, and has since the seventies. Um, they, people don't always know what to call them there in that sense. So that, that anyway, public symbols, but in that proverbial setting in a bar, if I say, yeah, I'm a priest, It's a degree of intentionality on my part because conversation in my experience will always go in one of, you know, two or three different directions, but pretty, always fascinating, but pretty predictable. I will always get to be either the recipient of someone's religious history, you know, good, bad, or ugly. Um, They will process it with, uh, with me, or they will bring up some aspect of, their life or their life in the world and their, you know, spiritual yearnings their spiritual thoughts, something it's never neutral is, is my point, you know? And that was something that, you know, and I was ordained as a priest, not quite 10 years ago. I mean, I didn't, you know, that I think as we talked did many other things with my life prior, and that was a definite, um, accustoming that I, and, and, and intentional thing for me. I thought, okay, this is what this is going to be like in most social settings, whether in the bar or as you mentioned, and this is what I'd love to explore a bit with you, the particular socioeconomic set, you know, setting where uh, by a good deal of the rest of my life, my tastes, my education, my temperament, um, so on, socioeconomically, I'll hang out and talk with a whole bunch of sorts of people, but like the people at Barrett and Ann's party were a little more, you know, my people in that sense, but yet I'm an outlier or could easily, I think quickly be perceived as such because it's generally not a socioeconomic demographic in Northwest Brooklyn these days where people are, um, religious, whether lightly so, heavily so, you know, otherwise, progressively so, in the um, and Episcopalian sense, or otherwise. So it's always fascinating to be in those settings, and you know, we could chat about you know what people talk about, whether they talk about their kids, they talk about travel, they you know, or you know, as you mentioned, if they all went to the same place for college or they all work together or it's, you know, work in the same kind of stuff, you know, they can talk about art or finance it being New York, you know, the, in, yeah. in that, in that sense. Um, and in many ways, it's still 
a choice in that sense for me personally in settings like that, you know, and it's more a, um, how much do I want to engage? Because I, you know, can spend a fair amount of my social life or the, the social settings of my life with that kind of, I forget whether we talked about this or not, but the, the question of translation from one vocabulary to another vocabulary. And a lot of my life can be spent in that mood. And, and that's okay. In fact, in many ways, it's more than okay. It's something that I felt drawn to. And it was part of, it was one reason I think why I wanted to become a priest. Because you do a lot of, at least in any Episcopal setting, you do a lot of cultural translation between different vo- sets of vocabularies. Um, we can talk more about that if, if you like. But mm-hmm. it, the most succinct way I think I'd have of putting that would be that, yeah, for me, for me too, like as a queer person, um, as, and as a queer religious person, but as a queer re- religious person who has generally been in progressive religious contexts, it was an, it, it it is at times less socially awkward to come out as a queer person within my progressive religious circles than it is um, not awkward but pronounced to come out as a religious person within sort of queer circles or progressive circles in that sense because there's a fair amount of yes I'm a re- religious person oh but I don't mean this 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 or this and you become pretty good at you know telegraphing that to someone um, quickly, or if you have the gift of longer conversation, uh, then, you know, which is kind of your metier, you know, you're, you're, this is kind of what, what you're up for. Yeah. Um, Getting people to have the sense of time to um, encounter one another with a, a fair amount of nuance. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's the more I've tried to reach out to people, the more I think pleasantly surprised I am by so many people. Like, I, I, I think I mean, if there's anything I could say I've taken away from this effort to do this podcast has been you cannot pigeonhole people. Mm-hmm. You can't assume like you really like, and, and and it seems so trite, but people mm-hmm. are so much more complex. And somebody says one thing, you think they're this way, and then they say something else, and then they're that way, and then they say something else. And we're all so much more complex than we we think we are. And I, and I don't know if and, and first I just want to say like I think in terms of like the the party and talking about like the same you know ha, like the people that get together. I think that it's you know we. I think that it's you should like getting being with people that you're comfortable with being with people that you like being that we were being with people that you're um you know that you that you have similarities to I think is 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 not like this is it's a bad thing right I mean people no, tend no, to, I, people tend I to get together and I don't and I, by no means when we're talking about this is it necessarily a, a bad thing it's good to mm-hmm. be able to like kind of let your guard down and know that there's a certain set of assumptions or people are all kind of same thing so you can talk more freely or commiserate with people who can tell you no you're not crazy we're going through the same thing I think to me what I what I'm trying to do is I think we need to be more mindful of realizing that there's stuff beyond that and we need to we should be more comfortable trying to find ourselves in those other kind of contexts um so uh, but but I think I was gonna say something else and now I've totally forgotten what it is this is what I get when I don't have my second cup of coffee um <laughs> <laughs> but but I think uh I, what, what was there's the lesson that you would mention you were um I think I, I think was it's just, it the I, translation or the the question of translation from one, one vocabulary to another, or was it the um, re- religious person in in a in, in a queer context? Or I mean, those are some. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I guess like what? Uh, how do you? Do, do you sometimes deliberately not identify, like do not provide information just to kind of avoid those kind of conversations? <laughs> Once or twice in a bar, um, and, and truly in a bar, an, an actual bar and not a metaphorical bar, uh, when I've sensed in particular that either I don't have the time for a 45-minute 
conversation, or I just don't have the social energy to be up for absorbing um, the energy from a random stranger about their thoughts about organized religion. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been times when I've said, I'm a teacher. <laughs> and, um, and you are. And I am. And so, you know, I'm not lying. And that, oh, but that generally lets the conversation just go where it's going. And especially because, you know, many conversations in a bar in that setting or in, um, you know, social settings where people are, are, are just kind of, uh, Oh, enjoying relaxing. Um, something like I'm a teacher is not really something to trip over it. it right. You know, it, 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 it pigeonholing or not, you know, you can say, Oh, okay. That, that quantity is a that, and I can put that there, and then we can continue talking about, um, you know, uh, whatever we had been talking, whatever the stream of conversation had been, you know, flowing in or toward prior to that. But you know, the more that I kind of live into things, the more I, I mean, I that. I don't know that I'd call it a temptation, certainly not in a spiritual sense, but. I don't really do that anymore in, in that sense. It, it lingers more as a, I think as, more as a self-protective or a time-protective social device in that sense. But no, it, it's been a long time since I've, I've done that. I've definitely gotten quite good at steering the conversation with, you know, it, and, you know, encounter with a stranger in any number of settings. Um, if I sense that the energy, let's say around religion, because it, at, as soon as I say I am a priest, it always, you know, it's right there in the room, whatever that means for them. And frankly, at times I have time and often I just don't, you know, in that sense, mm-hmm. which is not meant to be an unkind thing, but um, um, it, it more has shown to me that in the variety of social, it, and any number of settings, um, classed in different ways, um, but the people are interested to talk about stuff, you, you know, however you phrase it. And religion, no matter how you want to frame it, is um, is not a a neutral thing that you know is is easily shelved, um, uh, regardless of what someone's history with it has or has not been. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I can't say that I do that anymore, but I definitely mm. will steer conversation if I feel that I don't have the time, you know, just don't have the time for it or, uh, the energy for it, let's right. say, and the, it can vary widely, you know, mm. like I, I reached a point where I'm no longer going to be, um, <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of people who have been damaged by religion. Most certain, you know, especially, you know, conservative, um, judgmental religion and of all sorts, you know, not just Christian. And I, there are times when I'm up for, you know, playing therapist, which is definitely the, although, you know, I always say I am not a licensed therapist, but, um, I'm no longer going to be, you know, someone's um, punching bag, mm. as it were, as they are working out whatever their trauma is. In in that sense, if I don't have the time for it, or if it's not like you know my responsibility for it, um, mm-hmm. that uh, there are there are gentle ways of you know engaging and redirecting w- with that and saying you know that sounds difficult, you know, <laughs> and, and, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then moving on from that, which isn't to say that I don't, I don't know, 60%, 70% of encounters like that still end up uh, engaging and having really an interesting conversation, but I definitely have to be up for it. It's, it can take up a good deal of, um, of my time. Whenever I step out of the bubble, you know, I think, your sense of mission, most certainly, you know, getting us to step out of the bubble. That bubble, in that sense, for me, is not just, you know, the geographical or the socioeconomic one, um, but w- within a place like New York, which is, as you have noted, an incredibly diverse place, 
not just in terms of thinking of, about race, but socioeconomically, um, cosmologically, as I like to think of it, you know, how do we all think of ourselves or of the human person? What is the human project? You know, all these things. Uh, so many. There's diversity, you know, in New York around every street corner in that sense. And I'll say that wearing a symbol like a collar um, of difference or of, I, I'm not, I mean, there are a number of ways to phrase it, but that is stepping out of a bubble whenever I choose to do that. And it is an encounter with difference. Um, you know, you, you find this interesting in our neighborhood, you know, um, which you may have described elsewhere on uh, the podcast, but have you ever described Halloween in, um, and, and what our neighborhood and trick or treating is like? I don't think I don't think I have, but I, I, I have an idea of what you're gonna what you're gonna describe because I've been but here. It for... is it is it it's intense, and you yeah. you have kids. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, three. So I mean, you, yeah. have you gone cut? Have, have you gone? You know, trick or treating? Yeah, on, on your yeah. yeah on that block, I've got a seventeen on year old, a thirteen year old, and eleven year old. So yes, <laughs> we've seen and, all of it. And, you see, and like seriously into costumes and and so on, and it's great. I mean, I I love it. Um, New York as a whole really, you know, really gets into it. Whether it's the you know West Village Parade or now I know you know Cobble Hill, the Cobble Hill Association sponsors a little Halloween parade from the park, and you yeah, know, it's yeah. mo- mostly for the l- l- little kids, but. Yeah, and um, that's not a little parade. That's a huge big no, deal. It's huge now. I know, and yeah. they block off. I think they block off the street for it. Yeah, but, please, uh, please close off the streets. Yeah, but like you know, Halloween is in some ways still a social mixer in New York City, and I think even in our neighborhood, yeah. because our neighborhood is a destination neighborhood for yes. trick or treating. Yeah, yeah, um, and people come. Whether it's just from the three blocks away from the NYCHA houses in Gowanus, which, you know, t- talk about the bubble, you, you know, you can walk two blocks, you know, two big blocks from the church. And you are emphatically not in Cobble Hill as Cobble Hill perceives it itself to be. But I love Halloween for that reason, because there is a, a um, or, you know, I love the trick or treating at, at aspect of it because all kinds of, of people are just roaming all over um and it's one of the few times i will say when people of color walking on clinton street don't um stand out in that sense i mean there are always people of all sorts walking on streets in brooklyn but our neighborhood is just the street life who's walking on it is i think on any given day you know 90 percent white and right. um, Halloween is a time when I think families, you know, parents and kids, people of color are just strolling on our, on our street in a way that they normally would not or would not have cause to. And, 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 and for that alone, I, I kind of love it. But uh, there are thousands of people, as you know, and as your listeners would probably love to know, I mean, thousands of people uh, and what I do, rather than hand out candy, is, um, you know, that, that sort of driveway gate to the courtyard, who, yeah. which, you know, is, is right there. The four years that I've been here, and some have been during the pandemic, when, you know, trick-or-treating was kind of strange. <laughs> Remember those, 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 those little shoots that people yes, had the on, their, yeah. on the yeah. stoops? You know, so you could contactless uh, candy delivery, which I thought was very New York. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I uh, so uh, as you may know, Halloween gets its name from being the eve of All Hallows Day, right? You know, um... <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> what the hell is that? What's that? Okay, go away. I did not turn on. Uh, I did not turn you on, Siri, but wow. Well, well, now we know. So all Hallows, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say it again. Not, not uh-huh. to say it, but uh-huh. or she, she will pop up. But 
All Hallows Day, of course, is just the the old English name for All Saints Day, which so it's a it's a major feast day uh, in uh, what, what I call the the Western Christian Church. And by Western, I mean as opposed to the Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, although they observe it in some fashion as well. And many cultures, as we know, um, Christian and otherwise, uh, sometime around that you know, kind of halfway mark uh, between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice mark a moment when uh, cultures, Christian cultures will call it, you know, a, a thin time. Uh, Celtic Christianity will say a, a thin moment. Uh, and thin in this sense, you know, the, the, the dead are somehow more, more present. Oh. <clears throat> right. But so anyway, that origin all Saints, um, we do stuff, you know, in church within the walls uh, that that is uh, a re- remembering of those who have died and so on and so on. But what I do for Halloween is um, I just put out a little table with paper and crayons and then make a little table elsewhere in that little garden with uh, candles and like a, a little plate and make a little shrine. I don't call it an you know, ofrenda uh, mm. because you know people in the U.S. I think have gotten, especially since that Pixar movie, have gotten very used to cocoa, you know, uh, cocoa, you know, Day of the Dead, and we can get terribly appropriationist in that sense. Uh, but you know, you, you don't have to pretend that you are. Mexican or from a Latinx sort of background in the, you know, post-Catholic, um, there are lots of traditions and the Episcopal tradition, the Anglican world most certainly has all Hallows Eve and all saints traditions. You light candles, you remember the dead. But the point is I don't do it with a, um, a branded Episcopal TM mark on it i just put out you know paper crayons and then have a little little shrine and what cracks me up though is to watch that thousands of people come along you know what it's like to go trick-or-treating with kids on halloween like they're it's a it's a neurological i think spot in the brain you're walking along with your your bag or your little pumpkin your receptacle whatever it is and you're going house to house and you're saying trick or treat and you get candy you go on the next one and you know you compare it and they pull up to the gate and i'd be standing there in a clerical collar you know symbol of difference and people know it's a church even with all the scaffolding and uh the, the kids come and they, they smile and they hold open their you know receptacle and i say i'm sorry there's no candy but you can write a name to draw a picture and light a candle for someone who's died. And there's always this like, if you'll forgive the term, there's a dead pause. <laughs> and it's really rather beautiful. Um, and it, it's also a bit of a social index of sorts. Um, because it's a time of social mixing in our neighborhood, there are people who I will say uh, who come from candle lighting cultures, whether they're religious or not. Mm. And they say, Oh, I know this. And they'll come in and they're not feeling, you know, religiously put upon and no one is asking them to, you know, sign some statement of creedal belief in that sense, you know, some, some sort of intellectual assent to some thought process about what is going on or not going on. Um, and, whether you know the neighbor, our neighborhood it has many, many post-Catholics and secular Jews and post-religious people, and at times those are exactly the folks who I've noticed to stop and they, they sit and they talk with their children. And oh, you know your your grandmother. Why don't you draw a picture or um, all kinds of stories? And I sit and I listen, and actually it's really lovely, and it's a social mix. Um, um, people who have experienced gun violence uh, have popped up in that in the most casual of ways. Oh, remember your uncle so and so? Yeah, why would we remember him? Which is not normally something that, at Cobble Hill, as we think of it in an enclave sense, is thinking or remembering. 
Mm-hmm. But that kind of mixing and stepping outside of the bubble or actions, and it's a ritual action, if you see what I mean. And it is it makes the bubble apparent and clear as something that, that we are carrying around constantly, all mm-hmm. of us. And what are things that can ask us to step outside of it and be present in a different way? In this case, you know, in a momentarily quite profound way to remember someone who has died in a fairly yeah. non, like non-sectarian way. It happens to be on the eve of all saints. But as we know, you know, Halloween in New York is a totally secular um, yeah. observance in yeah. that sense. Um, I love it. And yeah. it, it's a time for me personally when I'm wearing a collar, I'm obviously a priest and I'm a symbol of difference or of, you know, what, whatever people imagine a portal to be, to step outside, whether it's to step outside of their bubble portal, um, that kind of action and even just the presence of it there are, are people who I talk to because, you know, most people don't stop. They, they just nod. And at times, you know, some of the parents nod and smile politely with, a, yeah. you know, a look that says, um, keep moving. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is not for us. Move on. Not for us. Smile. That's very nice. Yeah. On, on, on we go. But right. I love the way that it both makes clear senses of difference. And it also totally invites people across whatever I call a low threshold, right? Um, whether it's a difference or otherwise. Is there, I've been thinking about like this aspect of spirituality and, and I think that the, one of the terms that comes up for me is like this idea of like, like humility. Um, but I think like with humility comes the idea of, I guess, realizing that there are things beyond you, right. And whether it's your ancestors or, you know, other people, um, and like what, what's been going through my mind as you've been talking about this is that in, and I, I, I get, we're talking about our neighborhood cause that's what we have in common. But I think that the mindset for like, say myself was like, I was, I guess if you tr- are trying to overcome odds or if you're trying to, you know, do bigger things or if you're trying to be the you know start your own company or you're trying to become a partner at a law firm like you don't have the luxury in that mindset to leave things to fate you don't have the luxury of being like there's a greater power that's just going to like let this case happen as it will or this this deal is going to happen because god will will it right you have to be very in the moment you have to be very like i can control this you need to have a certain level of like human arrogance i think that seems to and and to me collectively i feel like in our neighborhood there and and in the the social sector that we're in there is you don't have you don't have the you can't you don't have the luxury of being spiritual or looking beyond other things because th- that's just not how it works. You can't accept something like if this is if the if the coffee you got isn't good, you can't just be oh, oh well you know whatever. You have to be like well this 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 coffee sucks. I'm never going back there again. I'm going to the other <laughs> coffee around the place around the corner, oh, right? No, you there, can't there, accept things. And I, and I wonder, I like, if you say. go into like a smaller, like, rural setting where it's like you have to accept a lot because there's only one coffee place and it's your neighbor, and you have to just suck it up, and you don't have the luxury. Like, when it snows, there's no Department of Transportation that's going to clear the streets. You're going to have to do it, and you just got to let fate deal with things. And I think that that's one of the things, like, you saw even like during the pandemic, and two extremes on both ends, where like some people, like, we just need to do it. We need to fix it. We can't do it. And other people just like, you know what? It's just in God's hands. He's going to take, he's going to protect me or like whatever. And I, I, like, when I think about that spiritual versus secular, I think that's one of the things where I think, like, on the secular end, we need to be more, I think, conscious or more humble about this more than just us going on there's there's we need to be mindful of that and maybe sometimes yeah you just got to kind of roll with it but that's a very un new york mindset to say well yeah okay i'll just go with it i'd say that i did i uh, i i agree with you and i say that um the way that i phrase it for myself i often think it in terms of uh, the question of agency um you know how much do i have what what do i think i should have um who has it, who doesn't. 
social agency, you know, economic agency, so on. And I think we do live in a neighborhood, but in, of people who are used to exercising a fair amount of agency in their own lives and the lives of their children, the lives of um, the structures that they're part of and so on. Um, whether it's, you know, in a New York way, you show up at the meeting to say the thing. In, in a civic way, I mean, I think in New York we're used to thinking a lot in terms of what are the structures of civic agency as well. You know, have, have you ever been to a, a, a community board six meeting by any chance? No, or, no, no? I'm not. It's oh, try guess. it. Oh man, <laughs> go, go for it. Yeah. But, but the, you know, point being whether it's that kind of stuff or as you're saying more in a, um, what what school did I go to and what is my job and what school should my children go to and um, uh, exercising of agency and choice. And I think that yes, we can read that being, I mean, in particular to and in our neighborhood where there are, are, there are a lot of people who I think by virtue of socioeconomic place and, and um, systems they've, they've been part of prior, almost don't recognize that as being um, a particular human location to, act, to think of exercising that much agency on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I think most parents in our neighborhood even think of it as a good thing to teach their children to, you know, <laughs> make good choices, you know, uh, in that sense. And um, that's not a bad thing. But the notion of making choices to begin with, you know, like what would you like to wear in the morning and helping to teach your children that skill, you know, from the age of two or whatnot onward, as if it were a birthright to exercise that degree of agency in every aspect of your life. And I don't mean that I think that, you know, uh, children should not be taught to make good choices, right. uh, but but. I do think that that becomes, in most people, cosmologically analogous to the human position in the cosmos, in the world. And just on planet Earth, um, you know, our species has not been particularly good at exercising choices, um, whether um, war and bombing one another or, you know, uh, climate crisis. And, you know, in many ways, it is the excess of human agency and unfettered self-serving choice, I think that has landed us in um, a climate emergency. You know, how dare you restrict my economic agency, you know, to extract whatever I want from the earth and, and uh, ignore the sense of the common good and ignore the sense of us being bound up together in a common purpose. Um, and, you know, I have to say the, the, the pandemic, as you say, was fascinating in that regard in New York, because I think many New Yorkers in a certain socioeconomic place, not used to thinking of themselves as agency less, felt and had. There. Am, am I back? Yeah. Yep. No, yeah. Okay. Um, suddenly experience themselves as um, with a diminished agency. And I, I think I, that that did take spiritually a number of different paths from that point. Many people, I'm sure you, you and I you know, both know, really took it as an opportunity to think, okay, how, how does this apply actually to the rest of my, my life? Um, what would I like my life to look like? I would like to be, you know, connected to people more. I would like to be connected to a sense of a common human project, um, whether it's local or global. Um, and then I think there were many others who, um, whose sense of diminished agency just led to them feeling diminished in the world as well. Uh, and I don't just mean people in the Cobble Hill socioeconomic milieu. I mean, people who um, uh, just 
saw themselves as having less and less to say and do in the, in the world. I mean, it, it, the jury is most certainly still out on, you know, um, psychological and psycho-spiritual effects of that kind of reminding, you know, the great reminding of the lack ultimately of human agency and whether it's with regard to, you know, one's own mor mortality, you know, All Saints Day or, um, because actually that was something that I would enjoy watching to go back to that image with, you know, children or just families walking with their kids. You can see the neurological shift. And this is why I say neurological from the part of the brain that's thinking about candy, you know, and whether that's an addictive place, whether that, that that's a, a, you know, from that part of the brain to the part of the brain that encounters thoughts of its own mortality. <laughs> mm. Like, it yep. was a quick shift and it was not always like you, you could see it wash over someone's face. The reason why I say that is because like other instances when I am in kind of a fascinating and beautiful uh, position outside the bubble on um, um, Ash Wednesday, I don't know if, you know, at the beginning of Lent in the mm -hmm. Christian year, when it's customary to remind yourself or be reminded of your own mortality in hopefully in, I, I, in good religion and good spirituality in good ways, you know, not in you know, punitive or stupid ways, but in ways to say, you know, you, you are beautifully of the earth and to the earth, mm -hmm. you, you will return. And what a blessing. And the earth itself is a blessing and so on. There are good ways to do it. But um, I have occasionally with colleagues, you know, you take some ashes and I've stood in Long Island Railroad train stations and just sort of, you know, stood there with some, some ashes at times, put a little sign there. People who don't have time uh, to stop in a church or go to a liturgy. Um, and at times they haven't been in a religious setting in a long, long time, but um, the symbolism is apparent. And, you know, you're standing in a train station and or a subway and um, people know what you're offering and at times they, they shy away and at times they shut they they line up and you make the you know little put ashes on mm -hmm. on their forehead and you simply say you know remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return and that's it they go on about their day. They're, you know, as you were saying earlier, their day attending to questions of agency, their career, their children, their desires and wants in in the world. But the reason why I put that for me in a place next to the trick treating is because I can always see in their face. You know, they come with the you know the face, their game face, their commuter face, their whatever it is, and when they're reminded of their mortality, they open their eyes, they look at me and something washes over them. And at times some of them just say, thank you and go. And it's this, the best way that I can articulate it. It's as if I, in, in my role, it, you know, it's not about me, but in my role have reminded them and us both of like the, the shared secret you will die and I will die. And that's the shared secret. And in that, that is a beautiful mortality and an utter fragility. And we need to be gentle with each other because of that. And I haven't said that, you know, um, but I am convinced because I've done that many, many times that that is, and again, I often think in terms of uh, neurology and the little I know of neurobiology, let alone astrophysics and so on. I'm constantly and that's just translating like the, the extended metaphors of the Christian tradition, as I call it, translating it into and with um, astro both astrophysics and neurobiology and things of that sort, you know, you know, in my own clumsy way. But to be reminded of our common mortality, I think, is at its best what happened in a place like New York during the pandemic. And people responded in beautiful ways at, 
you know, in general. And I, you know, know many people who didn't live in New York and, and had very different experiences of the pandemic. Uh, they were more about um, hoarding and paranoia and fear and viewing one another as threat. Not that you couldn't find plenty of that in New York City as well. And you could, of course, find plenty of people being reminded of common care and mortality outside of New York, but in a New York specific way. Mm -hmm. And you can call that humility, you know, as, as, as you know, that word that, that you use, which I love. Um, and I love that actually about basic Buddhist practice and basic Christian practice when it's good, I think is also a calling to humility as well. It, it, I think, you know, I invited the, uh, a local Zen center to come and share space at Christ Church. And so mm -hmm. they sit on Saturdays and I will sometimes join them. And at times they'll have like a five-day retreat and they overlap and they're there on a Sunday morning finishing up and we're downstairs and there's a, kind, of, kind of a beautiful interchange going on. But like the word humility at its base actually has, you know, earthiness etymologically in it and i think the the reminder that we we come from the earth we will return to the earth that that is a blessing and that it is something we share in common with one another there are a thousand ways into that shared realization conversationally but with someone else um, ritually, you know, a lot of ritual spaces are about getting us to that place of shared humility and humus, you know, of the earthness, like shared humility mm, yeah. in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and a lot of, I think of what plagues us as a species and as a country, um, is, uh, it comes from the many things that either distract us from that shared awareness or that intentionally distract us. I mean, much of capitalism is about creating a sense of lack. And so we will, so we'll buy shit. And then, and then yeah. adequacy. Yeah. Which we can express, you know, in, um, psychological terms, you know, uh, uh, um, economic terms yeah. and somehow, uh, we can fill that lack with uh, buying stuff and that whole economy, you know, that extractive economy based on that exploitativeness and that notion of, of what actual profit is. I mean, mm. uh, like for me, a lot of my sense of religious call as opposed to like spiritual sensibility is in helping people connect to that basic sense of enoughness <laughs> just yeah. hilarious that yeah. if you saw the barbie movie you know ken has this mm -hmm. moment of realization when he realizes that he is he is kenough he is enough and mm -hmm. that yeah. helps him combat his own toxic masculinity in mm -hmm. that in that sense um but enoughness in our mm -hmm. Our, of the earthness, our mortality, our shared mortality, that there's enough mystery and beauty in that to last a lifetime in that sense. And we don't have to get into like magical thinking of like, you know, God will protect us and so on. I mean, our species has been doing a great job of destroying the earth and we may very well have done ourselves into, you know, an evolutionary bottleneck mm. where we, where our species will not, um, pass it on to, you know, uh, easily onto generations a century or so hence. Right. Well, but, you know, but I think mm -hmm. the part of this, though, I think is, and I, there's so many directions I can go with this, but I feel like that there's a couple things that you've alluded to. Like one, I feel like there's almost any human endeavor is going to have good and bad because most things are kind of like neutral. Like even like thinking about religion, like on the one hand, you know, there's, a, there's so much, like the idea of like realizing, you know, from the earth you came to the earth you'll go 
somebody could take that and be like, you know what? Yeah. So the heck with it. I'm just going to do whatever the heck I want. Like, because oh, totally. it doesn't matter. Right. So eat, like, I eat, think drink, be merry for tomorrow. Yeah, we just, shall die. So I can be totally irresponsible because it doesn't make a damn bit of difference what I do. And mm-hmm. others would be like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever I want. And I'm going to run roughshod over everybody because it doesn't matter anyway. Right. Um, but the other thing is like, I guess the, the idea of like humility is I feel like there's, I think even like with like climate, the climate issue is, you know, th- New Yorkers will all say that they're for this, but how many New Yorkers take Uber instead of taking the subway, mm-hmm. right? How many New Yorkers are flying on international trips and, you know, de- adding to the, uh, you know, the emissions and hurting the the atmosphere that way? Um, I was uh, just saw something on Instagram and I don't know, I don't know if this is true, but I assume it is like it, they were talking about like Davos, like the, that get together and you know, all the leaders of the world mm-hmm. fly in on their private jets to talk about saving the environment so i think there's and i think maybe this is where i guess i don't know if it's a humility but i guess also like the humility to realize that you're flawed and you're a hypocrite like in in that respect it's like and i think that in many respects i think sometimes the public dialogue would be better if we all stopped trying to stand on our soapbox to tell other people what to do and to realize that I'm I am a hypocrite too. What can I do to change what I'm doing? Because when you're telling people what to do, you're telling people what to do, and you're making them do what they're not comfortable doing. If you're already doing something, by definition, you're already comfortable doing it. So it's not enough to say, "Well, I want to get rid of coal" or "I want to get rid of this." It's okay. You're comfortable saying you know have with an electric car, but are you comfortable taking the subway for a 45 minute trip instead of getting an Uber for a 15 minute trip? Are you comfortable not flying to Asia for a vacation and instead going to the Jersey Shore for vacation? Like, and I think, and and it's not to say that you shouldn't do that, but I think it's saying like to think about more where where we in our humility realizing that we're flawed and trying to fix the things where we ourselves are could be better at, at the principles what we want. Cause I think that a lot of times I feel like things are used to tell other people what to do and it works both ways and are across the spectrum. So I think it's human nature. It's easier to just avoid doing something uncomfortable and telling other people to do it than it is for you to do it yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, any good, you know, all human systems, I think have ways of, of dealing with human flawedness and some do their best to, uh, exploit it, you, you know, yeah. like consumer capitalism is happy to remind people of their mortality if it, when it gets them to buy things. Exactly, right. right? But um, I think a, like a good religious system and the, at the, at, you know, an aspect of Christianity that I know I like is, and, and similar practices in uh, Buddhism and Islam and Judaism and so on, um, that, you know, you are... And there needs to be a balance here because, of course, they can tip over easily into I'm so flawed, I'm a terrible person, I'm unworthy, you know, and so on, which, you know, at various points in in history, that has been the flavor. But I think beginning in an awareness of common mortality in a beautiful sense is also beginning a a constant reorientation like rit- ritually every time that Episcopalians in the sense and R- Roman Catholics are the same get together, uh, you know, you confess, you make a group corporate confession. Um, uh, and then you hear words of ritual forgiveness. I mean, it's, it is a ritual exchange, but everything is grounded in that sense of, you know, um, we have not loved God, extended metaphor of God. We have not loved God with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. You know, and you can see that as, as incredibly facile because obviously people have been saying that for generations. And yet here we still are with, you know, rising uh, global temperatures, etc. cetera, um, racial injustice, dot, dot, dot. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, but I know just speaking for myself, um, I find it necessary to, there's, there's, um, there's a a Franciscan monk in, uh, or or 
Franciscan friar in uh, his Albuquerque, he's quite old now, named Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, um, who founded something a long time ago called the Center for Action and Contemplation. And the reason why I mention it is, is just because there are many, maybe this has been your experience as well, there are many people I know who live their lives in the activist world, but without a, they come to know that w- w- without some form of spiritual practice, they burn out pretty quickly. Um, and whether quickly is, you know, f- 40 years, but man, I'm tired, or whether it's, you know, three years and the world did not change, what do I do? Um, and I also know, uh, this is Rohr's point, you know, much of the contemplative orders in his own Roman Catholic tradition were uh, preached a certain contemplation that was at a remove from much of the, the world, you know, the cloister where you prayed for the world and so on. Although, you know, someone like, um, you know, Thomas Merton and many contemplatives in the 60s became huge peace activists as well. But Rohr's point is that the necessary I- intersection between acting in the world and what he calls contemplation, um, that that is the necessary practice. And that'll look like any number of things for different people. You know, religiously, that can look like a number of different things. For those who are not religious of any sort, some form of spiritual practice. And I'd say, you know, seeking out these conversations that, that, that you're doing, Michael, um, there's, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to project and say, you have to see this as this, but, you know, asking and listening is itself a spiritual practice, I would say, and trying to teach that to other people and model it um, as something from which to draw strength to be able to act in, in the world on the one hand. And then I also know someone like Greta Thunberg um, says actually that she doesn't preach hope. She preaches action because she thinks that hope comes from acting in the world, that it's a constant, hopefully symbiotic mix between a form of practice in the world and a form of what Rohr would call contemplation. And contemplation, I think, can involve contemplation of your own mortality as a place of honesty and as a a source of connection to all that lives, you know, in that sense. But contemplation can also, you know, just be contemplation of the beauty, um, the utter beauty of, of whether it's of of human love or the beauty of, um, you know, William Blake, the whole world in a grain of sand, you know, the, the, like the, um, Contemplation can be many things, but to restore us to a sense, a wider sense of possibility and ourselves in the world, some form of contemplation and some form of action. And action does not have to be, in fact, doesn't like, you know, jetting off to Davos and thinking of that as your form of action in the world. You would probably be better off composting your tea bags which is also, you know, a fairly ineffective form of combating climate change. But I compost my tea bags, right. but I, but I don't assume that that is going to save the world. That's a practice, though, that on any given day lets me feel as if at least my life is trying to align. My daily life um, is trying to align with what is needed what the fruits of my contemplation, religious or otherwise, might lead me to want to to do and to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, you, to go back once again to that humility, I think it's also the idea that, I mean, you know, at first, like, controlling yourself, but also, like, humans take, we're, we are, you know, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty crazy uh, we're pretty crazy and not like in a bad way i mean it's just we're 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 animals we're we're highly evolved yeah. animals but totally. we're we're totally but i think it's even in that i think there's a beauty to it because there's so much there's good and there's bad and i think that we're all i think in this day and age of like the interconnectivity i think a lot of the systems are oriented towards showing us the things that are outrageous but i do see like there are people that are trying to show the good there are people that are trying to like you know, show the uh, reasons for hope. And I think that to me, there's, you know, 
I think we need to have the humility to realize that you can't fix things and fix people overnight either. I think it takes time. So I think like, you know, for what I'm sure you have parishioners yourself where it's like it takes time to if somebody needs help they're not just going to change overnight it can take months it can take years it can take decades and i think that humility also builds into that like we want to bend the arc of history it's going to take time like they're you know even like even if you're even you jesus like you know look yeah. at his look at his writings and look how it still is not like i mean people can still take it lots of different ways people you know are people are people and i don't i just i guess i think my hope is in the fact that we are unpredictable and imperfect and i think from that there is just there's so much we can look at it as a bad way or we can look at it in a good way. And I think maybe that is in the end where like the idea of humility and faith come in is, you know what? I can choose to be negative. I can choose to be positive and you have really no reason for one or the other. So for the sake of our continued existence and our progress, I choose hope that I, that's that, I guess that's where, where I, try to push myself now and I try to choose the positive and I'm not going to, and I will fight my urge as much as possible to stereotype or to generalize anybody because I don't know their story. And there is really goodness in everybody. And I think that there's so many hard challenging things out there that can drive people to feel any number of certain ways that I can't even contemplate. You know, like it could be, it could be a neighbor next door to me. It could be somebody down the street. It could be somebody in another state. I just don't know. So to think that even somebody, and, and I don't, and I don't necessarily want to get into politics per se, but like even the people that espouse hateful things, I think there is, something that happened in their lives that has seized them to feel this level of anger and frustration. And I think to me, like in the, the, the talk about like free speech is to me, it's like I, I, with free speech, if somebody says something outrageous, there's lots of ways you can respond. But I think one of the ways to respond is to also respond with the compassion to fix, maybe not that person, but to think that there's a reason why somebody's feeling this outrage, this mm-hmm. out of control, this unhopeful that they feeling, I think their only resort is violence. Or their only resort is hate. So maybe you can't fix them, but we need to respond to some of the things that outrage us, not just with condemnation, but also with with true compassion, not righteous compassion, but like what's going on in that community? What's going on for those people that makes them feel this? We have to fix that. We have to alleviate that. You can't change everybody, but there's something happening that we need to care about. And these are fellow human beings that we need to earnestly try to help. Not to shut up, not to suppress, not to just punish, not to just condemn, not to just use as a way to show that we're so much better than them, but earnestly help them because it's the right thing to do. I, I, I agree. And I think the difficulty is in um, in doing, <laughs> it's the obvious thing to say, but in doing multiple things at once. Uh, and things, you know, multiple projects, let's say, and the projects have different time horizons in that sense. Cause mm-hmm. I, you know, I think there are, you know, time horizons like, um, uh, Israel Gaza, I'm all about a, you know, a ceasefire now and just happily state that, you know, um, mm-hmm. we need to stop dropping bombs and, um, killing thousands of people. Does that solve Israel, Palestine, Gaza? Not at all, you know, but like that's a short time horizon. A longer time horizon there involves any number of other human projects that involve a great deal of humility, a great deal of listening. Um, and probably also given our flawed state of our, of our species, um, probably involve some things like, you know, um, uh, call it like, you know, UN peacekeeping forces. Anyway, I'm not going to solve Israel Gaza on this call with you right no, now, but my, no. my point is even seemingly thoroughly intractable things, I think require us to do several things and us as a species on this planet, I mean, 
us to do different things at the same time with different time horizons. And definitely, yeah, exactly, yeah. you know, ecology and motivated from different places within ourselves. And um, different lanes and, too. Like yeah, different, totally, like there's totally, different totally. people totally. doing different things. Yep. Yeah. And, and that, that, whether it's a, you know, know your own lane, you know, <laughs> I can, I, I can advocate for any number of different things, but, um, you know, my lane, I am not a, an economist, let's say, but I have lots of opinions about a just e- economy, let's say, you know, um, um, I have a lot of thoughts about, um, learning to sit still and accept and hear silence and quiet, not as an absence, but as a fullness or as a presence. And I don't even mean, in fact, I don't mean an anthropomorphized presence, you know, of another being called God. In fact, um, I love the parts of the Christian tradition or, you know, Islam and Judaism and Buddhism as well that, that, that do not get overly theistic about a being you know, elsewhere, but that just that the mystery of, of being that we attune ourselves to and listen for and to is itself um, beyond language and it is beyond our ability to contain but we can listen for it and we can be returned to it. And that in that returning is this incredibly restorative thing that, that whether that's, you know, if you're into mindfulness uh, schools of meditation, we're just sitting and deep breathing. Um, that in itself does not stop the icebergs from melting. But I think Things like that, practices like that, short or long term, you know, short time horizon for that or a longer one, um, let us act and respond in the multiple ways that are necessary and in a way that comes from a place of humility and of quiet rather than franticness or panic or anger. Um, and whether that is in, as you're saying, in responding to and talking to some, someone, I mean, I, I, I think there are things that we, we need to do for, you know, for personal safety or for, um, justice. I mean, I think boundaries are not bad. Boundaries are good, um, uh, in a useful way. If they are generous, um, porous enough, and thoughtful. Um, and I think our culture as a, as a whole, I think setting boundaries can be good. Arguing over what those boundaries should be. Um, like I'm generally in favor of free speech, you know, but that, that is an age old conversation about, well, where, where does your, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not, if the word of right is, is one that I want to use and not just as a religious person, but, you know, as a, let's say as a generous hearted response, but like where, where does your generous hearted ability to say whatever you want, free speech intersect with your duty to not be an asshole, let's say, if I forgive my, my language. <laughs> and, and, and that's a spiritual duty to, to, you know, to, in that sense, but I think it's a civic duty as well. Like I, I think um, a sense of civic responsibility, and I don't mean the, the notion of civility, which at times has been a little weaponized by some, and at times even you know, on the so-called center left to you know, try and silence the, the very real anger of people who might want to say, like when, you know, when Trump was elected in 2016 and suddenly you know, the New York Times was traveling to Kansas and writing stories about what are these people thinking? And it was almost embarrassing to encounter stuff like that. I mean, I, um, people voted the way they voted and um, have objects of anger or of scorn 
whether it's out of their own um, economic resentment and understandable resentment, or, I mean, uh, resentment is another word that I spend a certain amount of time th thinking about, whether from a psychological point of view or a religious, spiritual point of, of view. Um, I think resentment is something that can just sort of accrue and pile up in, in all of us. And if we don't regularly exorcise it, I think it becomes, to it, it, it just becomes toxic. It, it, it corrupts us. It metastasizes within us. And if someone comes along and says, you know what, the source of your resentment or the rightful object of it isn't this over here or these 10 things or this mystery, it's this. Um, it's a lot easier. That, it's a lot easier. And that, just, you know, the, 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 those, those are not just people elsewhere. That's me as well. Those are my neighbors in New York. And I don't just mean, you know, my um, well-educated Cobble Hill neighbors. I mean, um, I mean, people in, people in, you know, in New York, people in Nassau County, where I, I lived in a very Trumpy part for uh, of Nassau County for about five years. Um, you know, people aren't dumb. There's a, yet that doesn't, I don't mean that, that objects of resentment are, and are logical. Um, but people know that things are awry. Um, things are amiss. Um, which is why, I mean, back to the saying, doing several things at once, listening and speaking with humility and saying, where might that be coming from? And how may I be present to that? And that just makes, is, is like one of the very necessary tasks for our own, I think, growth and humility and, and realness and authenticity, for one thing. I think it is also net necessary though to um that in times and places um to say you know no this is not all right or or it, you know this is um um i mean that has always been a, di a, a difficulty for me you know uh, i think my my natural personality is at times <clears throat> which I think is why I seek out things like uh, meditation and practices that inculcate more humility in me because my uh, tendency as a person is to, um, is at times to stand on a soapbox and um, uh, get into a bit of a scrap. And whether that's over you know, Trump's Muslim ban or, you know, uh, protecting migrants or um, uh, we, we, and the reason why I, I say that is because those are definitely things that um, when I lived on the south shore of Nassau County, um, when Trump was elected, those are the sorts of things actually that I, with some of my neighbors, went and protested outside of our local uh, congressional representative's office. Um, and, you know, there, there, there was the scuffles ensued with you know, other neighbors in that sense. I mean, they're, they're very real. It, you, you don't have to go far to step outside of the bubble in that sense. If I say even in New York State, you know, I mean that more as a reminder to myself. Living in Northwest Brooklyn now, um, there, um, there, there, uh, yeah, there's there, there's a good deal of diversity and disagreement right around the corner. Yeah. Well, I, I I think we could we could go strongly into a second, if not a third <laughs> hour. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think we should wrap up. Um, but um, can I 
can I ask, you know, and I, we've probably alluded to this and, you know, the whole time, but you know, what gives you hope at the end of the day? Yeah, I've been, li- I've been listening for this in my own conversation uh, in response to your questions, Ashley, since you, <laughs> you let me know that you'd be <laughs> asking that. Um, I'd probably answer it in a couple of different ways. And the first one or two are just in... Uh, the kids today, for the most part, um, I know a lot of, through one way or another, a lot of, um, um, and by kids, I'm 52. So I mean, like, you know, people in their early 20s. Um, and for the most part, um, I mean, there, are, there, yes, we have a mental illness crisis in all ages and generations, but a lot of the people I know in their 20s have their heads screwed on in very sane ways. And um, they at times need help from the rest of us, I think, in terms of um, maintaining a sense of of, um, hope or feeling heard uh, for common action and common work. But they are not kidding themselves. And I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush, but... I have a lot of hope just in the, the sense of these are a lot of people who are um, alert. And I find that very hopeful in, in, uh, for me personally. Um, a second source for me is just um, learning to slow down and be still. Um, no matter how frantic no matter how frantic um, my day might or might be at any given moment, being still and being quiet, whether it's going for a walk, even in our our general neighborhood, you know, going for a walk around the block. um, If I say connecting with nature, that's hard to do in New York. But frankly, you can do that by taking care of a house plant and um, sitting, caring for something, caring for something outside of myself. Um, You know, people who have children, at times that's a source of anxiety as well, but uh, you can be anxious about your house plants. But I've... I've, um, We put house plants straight to ash. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But like walking down to, uh, walking down to the harbor, oddly, um, and sitting on Pier 6 and yeah. look, look, I mean, even with the awful noise of the helicopters, you know, uh, of all those tourist helicopters and the rich people helicopters and so on, what I like about and what's hopeful to me about that is it's a connecting with some form of, I'll call it the natural world, for lack of a better word, because, word, you know, I think we're part of the natural world. We just kind of mess it up often but i love being there especially when the tide is running the tide is shifting you know it's coming up the bay or or it's coming down the east river or you know the the tides are meeting because it's a part of that environment that is so dominated by human-made things you know back to where we began the question of agency new york the whole landscape feels like it's the one vast expression of human agency Nothing that we look at would be there if humans hadn't said that. Yeah, even and parks. Even parks. And and so to be there and just watch the tides come and go. It's also why I love taking the uh, the ferry, the kind of new-ish uh, New York City ferry, because you're there and you can feel the chop and the wind and the tide come and go. And that to me is deeply if I say it's hopeful, it's because it's deeply restorative. So I find the kids hopeful because they're alert. I find this, I find the tides hopeful because they just restore me to a sense of the world that is actually not beyond, that is beyond my agency and my control and it will continue. And that's kind of my third sense of hope, um, um, which will sound bleak to some people. I was reading this great book, Last year, by the um, a, a writer, I think she's a, a Scottish writer named Cal Flynn, 
Um, and she was traveling all around the world, visiting places that humans have abandoned, either because we've had to, because they're toxic or because they're, you know, demilitarized zones or, you know, but places that in many ways our species has had to leave alone, like Ch- Chernobyl, you know, or the area around Fu- uh, Fukushima, closer to home, you know, all around fresh kills on Staten Island and the um, outflow of the Passaic River and the Arthur um, kill and full of PCBs and so on. But places that we would think of are just without life because they're not safe for us or because we've, you know, abandoned them. And they're full of life. This is kind of her thesis and she repeats it again and again, pulsing with forms of life. And her question continually is, you know, we may or may not have created or helped to hasten and, you know, the evolutionary bottleneck for our species. And, you know, is that generations and generations hence, who knows, but, you know, have, have, have we tipped over something in the earth's balance that will make it unlivable for us? Who knows? But life in some form continues to pulse and she, but you know, has all these wonderful examples having to do with like short term evolution and moths and in, in, you know, industrial Manchester, in England and so, so forth. And I find that perversely incredibly hopeful, Michael. And that's sure. a weird way to put it because it's a hopefulness. And I find that actually a very godly way to think about it. And even from a religious point of view, I think that a, the- a Christian theology that is so focused on humanity is messed up. And the, the idea that humanity may or may not be around, but that the creation, to use the rest of the Christian metaphor, might, you know, other planets, it's a big cosmos, you know, it, 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 um, I find that hopeful and restorative in the same way that I find all forms of meditation. And it's, it's very Buddhist in that mm-hmm. sense, pop, pop Buddhist, you, you know, I say in my appropriationist way to encourage the sort of detachment. Uh, even our species may no longer be here, but to come to some form of peace with that and still find it useful to love my neighbor love my neighbor as I love myself to use a Mm -hmm. Christian phrase is a weirdly hopeful place to both begin my day and end my day. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds perfect. All right. Well, that's a perfect (laughs) way to end this. So thank you so much, uh, Mark, for, for agreeing to come on and for, I guess, having such a a wonderful and I'd, I'd say definitely inspiring and insightful conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Right. And, and I thank yeah, good luck with the rest of your project. I think it's wonderful. Well, thank you. It's been a, it's been a very, in some respects, very selfish uh, project in that it's given me, I think the comfort and the assurance that I wasn't feeling before. So, um, mm-hmm. so thank you. And um, thank you to all the listeners and viewers out there. May you go out and explore our country with curiosity, respect, compassion, and humility. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. We'll see you around.